if you're 17 years old and you have a 20 year old teacher, you still have to stand up and say, good morning, miss, or good morning, mister. Good afternoon, miss, or good afternoon, mister. Everybody was mister, mister. So, but when I first got here, you know, the children would call the teachers by their first name. So I remember when I went to the school to get registered, you know, everything that um, the men said, I would say, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And my aunt started to laugh because no other, the other children does not respond like that. You know, they will be like, yes, the, the adults talk to them and they say, yes, yes. There was no miss or mister. So when I was like, every, every response was yes, miss. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. She started, you know, she just thought that was funny because, you know, it's just like that that's not the, you know, that rule is not here for the children to do. Welcome to the Immigrant Experience in America, an immigrant human library, where we amplify and humanize the experiences of immigrants in the United States and around the world. Listen in as we add another story to our immigrant human library. I, and I've had conversations in interviews before where we talk about the fact that manners is just not a big thing here. Mm -hmm. And I and I, I feel like I go the extra mile when I deal with young people or even with my daughter to make sure that I teach her to say please and thank you or to say good morning and to say and give some sort of deference to people who are older because that is not it's definitely not taught very much here. And, you know, that I think manners is something important for kids to learn because it will follow them as they go through life to show respect to people as they interact with others. But I mean, I there's a, another conversation about the history of the United States and why that came to be. But uh, yeah, we'll talk about that another time. You know, we had to be very respectful to anyone we see, you know, someone is older, if when walking home from school, we had to pass, we walked through the districts. And if you see someone sitting on there, well, we say veranda, but here they said porch. If you saw someone sitting and you walk and pass and never say good evening, ma'am, or good evening, mister, or good morning or whatever, you know, I, you know, that's like a, a lesson for you because they, they're going to go tell your parents, hey, you know, your child passed my home the other day and they don't have any manners. They saw me sitting and they didn't, they walked past me like they didn't even see me. Yes. You know, so we, yeah, it's, it's, it's like, it's just a thing. If you, you have to, or else you'll get a, um, you get a scolding for that. Right. Yeah, that's definitely part of the Jamaican culture. Like, you know, mm -hmm. everybody speak, even if you don't know the person and you walk into the doctor's office, you come in and people are sitting there and you walk through the door, you mm -hmm. say good morning, good, you know, hello, or how, you know, you don't have to go into the big long conversation, but you, you greet people. That's a regular yeah. thing that you walk around in Jamaica. Yeah. And everybody says hello. Good morning. Good afternoon. You know, it's just, and I noticed that when I was there recently too. So yeah, that's a good point you're making. But you yes. know, and so it or makes if you, you don't do it. They'll curse you. They're like, "Hey, you don't see me sitting here. How come you just walk past and you didn't even say you don't have any manners?" <laughs> <laughs> right. It's true. And and the funny thing, you know, I after a number of years of being here, the culture shock of just the way things are here in the United States. It can. Oh my gosh. It can be, it can really tire you and wear you down and just trying to figure out like how people operate. Cause I remember after a while I used to walk and say hello to people and people, it, you know, some people won't even speak to you. If yeah, you just they, pass won't, even, and say they hello. won't even respond to you or if they, they will respond to you, they give you a fake smile. It's like right. a smile for one second and their face went back to being serious. You right, right. That's a real smile or what? It's just like a smirk. Right, exactly. Yeah, so after a while, I, real, I, I realized over the years that I actually stopped speaking because I didn't know who was going to appreciate my good mornings from who would not. And so I would only say good morning if it was people that I know would because appreciate me greeting them. I think it's a norm for some people. And I think it does belong. Um, it depends on the state. Red kids to say, yes, ma'am, yes, sir. And if she walk into a room and she see people, she will speak because that's how she was raised. So I does I think it belong. Um, it depends on 
the state or the city, you know. Every right. state have different ways of doing things. Right, exactly, exactly. So that's a good point you're making, Nadine. And thanks for mm -hmm. sharing a bit about your what life was like in Jamaica, what life was like in the initial stages as you move here from Jamaica. And so I'm wondering as you, you know, you realize, okay, this is a new place that we're going to be living. What was your American dream? And, you know, what were some of the challenges that came along as you really just tried to figure life out here? Well, you know, coming here at 17 years old, I didn't really have a specific dream in mind apart just going back to school because at that age, you know, there's nothing much I could, re I wasn't really thinking what, what I want to do, where I want to be. So, you know, I went back to high school immediately and I did have a part-time job as well and, you know, went on to college. It was, it was like later in my twenties, you know, mid twenties when I really, probably think what I really want to do with my life, you know. So I lived in Kansas City for eight years and then I relocated to Georgia. Right. Okay. Yeah. And I don't know if you could talk about like, you know, how did you figure things out? Like figure out how to, what was it like applying for work, interviewing, which is not something that we had to do when we were in Jamaica. We didn't actually get to that stage in our life. What was it like? I know you had to go through a, a few interviews because you worked in the banking industry for a year, for a, a number of years. So what was it like interviewing and, and, you know, and applying to job? What was that like for you? So my first job here in the United States was working at Kmart with a cashier. Interview, it wasn't too much stressful because we got referred by our, you know, cousins that was already working there. And everybody knew knew them and loved them. You know, they were hard workers. So it wasn't too hard for us to get on. But it was later when, you know, after you finish your degree and you have to really go out there and find a career. You know, as I was saying, public speaking for me, or I do get a little timid sometime when I have to do interviews. But I try to, you know, put my best out there, you know, and just show my experience, my past experience, you know, I'm a hard worker. I'm easy, um, easy learner, you know, so. Right. Okay. All right. So Nadine, can you talk about your, like your career path? So you, you went on, finished your undergrad. What have you done over the years? Like, what are some of your accomplishments and what are you yeah. doing now? So no, yeah, I know you just mentioned, I've been in banking for over 20 years. And um, I became a real estate agent. I got my license two years ago. So, yeah, I'm in the real estate business as well now. Okay. And um, any challenges in particular that you'd like to share about, you know, the work world, managing a family and, you know, just being an immigrant and trying to figure things out? Do you have any advice or for like some of the, the biggest challenges that you faced over the years? Well, as you mentioned, you know, having a family, which we kind of touched on before, having a family and working, you know, that is very hard. Even now, sometimes my children have to go to, you know, different activities. Well, just just to um go back a little bit, I've never had a chance to let them participate in any activities because I was never available. The, um, to take them at the time where they needed to go. So now my daughter is doing color guard and, you know, I'm trying my best. She's in high school now and it's, it's sometimes hard to find, a, you know, transportation to take her because of the time, you know, so that, that is a big challenge for me being, right. being um, working a full-time job, having children, you know, they need to go places, but you just can't be there. To right. Them. Yeah. And that's part of the challenge of raising children in a country like the United States where work, work is such like a priority yeah, in a lot of our yeah. lives, right? It's like you're always on the go. I mean, you know, it's, it's just a fast-paced country. You always, you have to be, 
is a constantly moving. <laughs> I right. know sometimes, like you always ask me, when are you going to slow down? When are you going to do this? When are you going to, but it's like, it's always something to do that you just always have to keep going, you know? Right. And how, what do you think, uh, interestingly, what do you think it would have been like raising children in Jamaica? Well, I think in, um, it would be, maybe, I think it would be easier in some sense because, you know, I'm not trying to compare my children with other, but sometime now, you know, when I do get a chance to speak with a child, my daughter's age, and they're so much mature. It's like, because, you know, I know that's the way I was too, because we had the chance to go out and take taxis. You know, we walk to school, we take taxi to school. Parents can send their children to stores, you know, at, at that age and they go and they come And back. that's in Jamaica you're referring yes, to, in right? Jamaica. And so now when I do talk to a child, my daughter, it's just like, you could just see the difference. You know, the maturity level is so much different. Um, I think the children over there is more open they're more exposed, not, not in a bad way. It's just, you know, they're more exposed to the reality of life. Right. And you're right. They're given more responsibilities probably. Yeah. Right. Yeah. My, yeah. Cause I yeah. see children in Jamaica, once they pass the common entrance and have to go to high school, there's so many of them who travel for miles. Yeah. Taking Ten public years transportation. Old, you know, I told my daughter all the time, a 10 year old child is going to high school. And they may have to travel hours to get to the school, different taxis. They have to take a taxi from one location to another every day, you know, morning, evening, and, you know. Right. Yeah. And I see, we see it all the time. They travel for miles away from home and, you know, they have to, it's just a part of the culture. I mean, a, yeah. lot, of, a lot of high school children have to just travel across the island to get to their high school that they're slated for. And so, yeah, yeah children here. They're mature in certain things, but not in others. That because yeah, the security they're, situation they're, here, we have to be careful sending our children out too much because of some, you know, things that we've heard that has happened on the news or, but interestingly, I spoke to somebody who grew up in New York and they say they, they were able, they, they were expected to do that. Travel, take the train with their younger ones and take them mm -hmm. here and take them there. And so maybe it's the suburban life that kind of keeps yeah, these kids in the house. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, because the kids more, they're more sheltered here. So it's like when you ask them to do something, it's like they're lost. They don't understand what you're asking them to do. Right. So, so interesting. Two different worlds. And we just hope that we are doing the best that we can for our kids and preparing them to be adults who can, you know, be able to handle whatever life brings them so um, yeah. but you know I think they're smart kids they're gonna be all right yeah um, and yeah I, I think into some time maybe I'm uh, I get maybe a hard on them because I know at their age what it was what I was doing you know like I'm like I mentioned talking to now I speak to a child my daughter's age but I do remember when I was her age you know how it was so I, I think I still have those memories and I'm expecting her to be like that too right right and that's where we have to be so mindful to kind of um balance the fact that they're living in a different environment they've had different experiences different exposure Mm -hmm. And kind of allow them to be kids right where they are. It's it's not easy. Const it's a constant yeah. struggle being an immigrant mom. And um, then the world is so different. Not only different cultures, but it's so much electronics that's going around. It's hard to keep your child away from it. If I said, don't watch the TV so much, then he will go look for the Nintendo. If I take the Nintendo away, he's looking for the computer. It's like, it's like a constant fight trying to get them to take up a book. Mm. Yeah, yeah, the children these days have so much distraction. We've talked about that before. Mm -hmm. When we were growing up, we didn't have cell phones. Cell phones mm -hmm. was like, yeah. And we didn't have all these distractions. So, you know, oh my gosh, they're getting so much, being so overloaded, inundated with so much information, mm -hmm. exposed to so much online 
that you just hope, but my gosh, that you're making or doing right by them, you know, allowing them to get exposure to some of this stuff that, you know, eventually will prepare them in some sense to be comfortable using technology because that's the world we live in. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, the distraction, they're not necessarily mature to handle the distraction and managing that being so young right yeah it's hard to balance because like you said you know you don't want to deprive them but at the same time you don't want him to have too much of it so it's like you know it's yeah it's a constant struggle girl I deal with it I see you dealing with it and I've talked to so many other parents who are just trying to work it out and praying at the same time that you do right by them Oh my goodness. So I wonder, Nadine, you know, with your accents, you shared a little bit, like how, how has it been for you kind of navigating the work world, being this immigrant woman, you know, very motivated and driven and trying to, you know, achieve things? What was it like being an immigrant woman in, a, in, in the workplaces that you've worked throughout your time here? You know, I did talk about that question, but I didn't really have any issue being being an immigrant woman, you know. I maybe because well, in the last fifteen years, I work with immigrants themselves. You know, I work with Asians, so maybe that way it's, we were. You know, most of us that work there were immigrants, but you know, you know, I. I never really have any problems because I know you know they know I'm a hard worker. Um. The, the responsibility, the duties they give to me, I just get it done, you know. So I've never really had any problems being an immigrant in the workplace. Right, right, right. Okay. And you do, um, and no specific challenges as far as, you know, maybe your accent or any other. I'm just particularly just thinking about, uh, you know, because we've both kind of, after college went off to different places like have you had any specific challenges where you find like you weren't really in the in group of certain places whether socially outside of work or anywhere like you know yeah, I'm trying to get I, a sense I of think, what your um, immigrants what was your immigrant experience like living I think in America? my my biggest my biggest problem with when I first moved like you know was high school trying to fit in with other students, you know, I was new and my accent, you know, and I, I think that was the biggest time the most challenges I have was high school. Mm-hmm. But after, you know, I, I started talking to more people, getting out there, meeting people, working, you know, it was fine communicating with everyone else. You know, we would joke around from time to time. They'll make fun of my accent. And if I say a word that's different, you know, like I could give some example. When I first started working in the bank, you know, back in Jamaica, we said deposit. In America, they said deposit. So I remember when I, my first job at the bank, I would say deposit. <laughs> so they would make fun of me all the time. <laughs> and even for me now, I could laugh at myself because it sounds so funny when you say that. But because we were under the British colony, some of the words were pronounced differently. And so, yeah, in Jamaica, we say, we don't say deposit, we say deposit. And, you know, I remember my coworkers, you know, you know, at times of time, they would make fun of me, but it was just all fun. (laughs) Right. From how you pronounce certain words, pronounce certain (laughs) words, right? Yeah. And then um, I don't know if you remember, you remember Pasio? You remember Pasio? Was it Pasio Road in Kansas City? P-A-S-E-O? Yes, Paseo, Paseo. So yeah, I would always say Pasio, Pasio. <laughs> when I, I yeah, and they was like, it's not Pasio, it's Paseo. <laughs> it depends. The, the the Latinos with their Spanish accent might say Paseo, but I mean in English it could be Pasio. Yeah, you know, because we be- we pronounce our a different, so it's like when 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 they say it, it's like it sounds like it has an L. When they say paseo, but I was like, no, it's not paseo, it's paseo. And they're like, no. So it took me a long time to to um transition to the way they speak. Right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> it's an um, yeah, that American accent type of a thing and the British accent uh, differentiation. Yeah. yeah like, no. 
like my name, they say Nadine, but it's really Nadine. So when somebody said Nadine, I said, oh, that person must be from, they're not American. They When they said Nadine. Right. Right. The, right. The stress is different when they're putting the pronunciation. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, Nadine, if you had any specific advice for immigrants, you know, and then we can talk, you can tell me a little bit about the, your experience being a real estate agent, right? Any any particular advice you have for immigrants just coming here and trying to figure this world out? It it can be so daunting and 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 uh, challenging trying to adjust to this new environment. Yeah, um, I I would say you know don't be afraid to talk to people. Like for me, I I think over the years I shun myself away from. Um, people, there's a, probably a lot more I could have learned and get more assistance if, you know, I was not so shy to talk to people. But, you know, I'm opening more and learning so much more, even with being a real estate agent, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, and if there's something you want to do, you know, you have a dream. A lot of immigrants come here they already have what they want to do when they come, but then they get out there in the working world and they lost that dream because, you know, trying to make an ends meet, you know, trying to work to survive. But if there's something you want to do, you know, try to stick to it and just get it done. Yeah. You know? Right. Yeah. That the hard work mentality. So tell us more about, you know, this real estate space that you've entered and what has it been like since you've been working in the space and, you know, what are what are some advice that you may have for people as they try to find a real estate agent, you know, and like what are some things that are happening with real estate today? Well, I've been licensed for two years, but this is something I've always wanted to do. This is why I just mentioned if there's something you want to do, no, don't wait to get it done. Because I, I had a look at real estate back in my early uh, mid twenties, and sometimes I wish I've done it before because, you know, I would be well seasoned right now if I had done back before I, I had my children. I know right now, you know, everyone is maybe just a bit scared of the market, you know, trying to figure which direction is going. But, you know, I think the rate is, uh, the interest rate, I think, is not so much of a scared because, you know, I, I got my first house when I was, what, 28 years old, 28, 29. And at that time, my interest rate was about five and a half percent. So it's not so much different now than what it is back then. So, you know, I don't think people should let that scare them from actually buying a house because, you know, if you really think about it, when you're renting a place, you know, you're paying a hundred percent interest rate because all the money you put into the renting is going to somebody else's pocket and you don't get anything from it when you walk away. But if you do buy a property, at least, you know, you own it for five or 10 years and you decide to sell it, the property appreciate and you can get some equity. Right. I, I think if somebody is out there that really thinking about buying a property, maybe it's a first time home buyer, I don't think they should let the interest rates stop them from doing so. Right. And, you know, there are also programs out there for first time home buyers. So if if um coming up with a down payment or the closing cost is also a problem, you know, that they also can look into getting some down payment assistance. Sure, sure. I came across an article recently that talked about some of the fraud that takes place in the real estate space. For example, somebody moved into somebody's home during the pandemic and was living there because somebody had come up with a fake yeah, um, it's, it's agreement called, um, and sold it's and a sold quick it. Deed. I, I'm it's, sorry, say that again. It's called a quick claim deed. Because yes. Because what happened, the lady, she lives in Maryland, I believe. And she had a property in Florida. But during the pandemic, she stayed away for a long time. So somebody realized that there was no activity going on over the property. So somehow they had um, a transfer. They used a quick claim deed to transfer the property in their name and, and was living there. 
So when the lady came after a few, um, maybe seven or eight months, she decided she wanted to visit her property. When she reached there, somebody was living in her property. She had a hard time to get them out. She had to call the city. The and claim that they had bought the property. Yeah, I think, I believe it was for $75, 75 and And so they were asking, who buy a property for $75, you know? It was just, yeah, it's, and I, I did see another incident a couple of weeks ago here in Georgia where I believe it was um, somebody in the military, they put their property on the property, they put their property on the market for sale, but then so they realized there was a tenant inside the property. So somebody rent them the property. It wasn't really the owner that rented it. but And, and wow. so they were trying to go through, trying to remove them. So, yeah, when those things happen, you know, it's a hard thing to deal with. And so what, any, any advice for people to handle, you know, when something like that happens? I mean, do they need to get some legal assistance or something? You know, for a situation like this, I, I, I know what happened is, there are the you know there's there are a lot of fraudsters out there looking for different opportunities with the real estate market. So they will notice that the property is coming up for a listing, and somehow they would capture the information and pose it as its rent is is being listed for rent. So they would collect some rent upfront from you and and rent you the property, but it's not it's not really their own. I had a friend that was looking for property. She, you know, she's looking for rent of property. So she contacted me and I was uh, helping her to look. But she called me one day and she said, do you know, I found this property that I really wanted to go look at. And I communicated with the agent or the person that lists the property. And they told her she, in order for her to secure the property, she needed to pay them some money up front. They wanted her to give her the debit card. So she she didn't feel comfortable. So she went and buy a gift card and gave them the um what? The, yeah. So, so she got to the property, she went to view the property, and the guy is telling her, it's so you know, he he she's telling him, you know, yeah, I'm at the property, but I cannot get in. He told her to break the door. She is so she, she's like, are you serious? She said, yeah, I'm giving you permission. Just break it. It's OK. And then she said there were neighbors outside looking. So she's like, I'm not doing that. You know what? You 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 telling me to break the door and go inside the property. And there's neighbors around here looking at me. Then when they call the police, what is going to happen? So she went away. And the next day she saw the same listing came about again with a different agent. So she contacted the agent. The agent told her, you know, she contacted the agent and she said, Are, is this your property? She said, yeah, this is my listing. You know, so it happens. I have another one where I actually was helping somebody. This one, I actually went to the property myself, but I did try to contact the listing person. They never, I, I'd leave them a voicemail telling them I was a real estate agent and I'm trying to view their listing. They never responded to me. We got to the property just to see if it has a super lock box, because if it did, I would be able to open it. But it was a combination. They had to give me the combination to go in. So the property was listed. It was a rental property, three bedroom in Snellville. It was listed for $1,350 for rental. We said, oh, no, that sounds like it's way below market right now. It's too good to be true. The next day, I actually see, big, and I couldn't find it on the multiple listing service. So that is another thing. You know, they use Realtor.com to do fake listings. If it's not on the multiple listing service, then something is wrong. Which is Again, the MLS. Most people yes, refer the MLS. to that as the MLS. Yeah, okay. which is what the real estate agent have access to. So if you, if you cannot locate that property there, you know, there's something wrong. So when I when I noticed the next day the property came up again, and so I said, hey, you know, I see the property and and it's it's really listed for one thousand seven hundred fifty dollars. She said, yeah, I figured something was wrong. It was too good to be true for it to be. Yeah. So I believe now that is becoming more prevalent. The the fake listing. So 
if somebody's out there looking for property and they come across one, if it's too good to be true, most likely it is you should have an agent check it out for you. You know, they can go into the multiple listing service and see if the property is actually listed there and who the agent is just listing it. Okay. That's one way. And and also no one, no, no agent would ever ask you to pay them up front to secure the property. They will never ask you to give them a cash down payment to secure it if you really want to rent it. Yes, right, right, right. And so how do people find your service, Nadine? Well, I am on Instagram. I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook, LinkedIn, and TikTok. But I can also give you my handles later to post. And oh, just one more important wire um, fraud that I, I noticed now is happening a lot is called the escrow wire fraud. This one is when um, the perpetrator noted that somehow they will hack into the closing attorney's email. And they, if they notice a closing is coming up, they will also email it to the buyer. They will send a wire instruction to the buyer for you to wire your closing down payment to them. So you should always, you know, know make sure you know who your closing attorney is. You're, you're communicating with them on a regular basis. And also always verify the wire instruction before you send the wire because that is something that is happening a lot now. And once the money is gone, there is no way to retrieve it. Wow. Yeah, I've yeah. heard of people actually clicking on those fake emails and sending the money and it just disappears. Yeah, because I've seen it happen to someone where she got the email. She she thought it was coming from the closing attorney when it was time for her to do her closing. She had to wire her down payment and closing costs and, um, you know, the total amount. She never verified it. She got the email and she thought it came from the um, actual closing attorney office because the email is going to have the closing attorney name and their instructions, but different bank, different routing number. If you don't call and verify it and you do go ahead and process your wire, that money is gone. You will never get it back, you know. Oh my goodness. So, There's so much fraud and scams there is a out, lot there. Of fraud out there. Some of them, you know, I won't talk about on here, but those are the ones I would say, you know, make sure you verify, always verify because once you, once you send it, there is no way to retrieve it. Right. Oh my goodness. My gosh. Well, thanks for sharing all that um, good information for people and especially immigrants who are new to the United States and, you know, buying property overseas in other countries tend to have different ways of operating, different, you yeah. know, ways of going about getting a property and so forth. And so it's different here in the United States. So be cautious, be careful in selecting a realtor, making sure that you trust the person and that there's no fraud or scams involved and so forth. As Nadine is uh, sharing a few of those incidents with you. And, you know, just be careful when you're operating online these days. I mean, everything seems to be uh, a big deal just yeah you know, going just, online. just make sure you know you double check with your agent double check with the you know closing attorney make sure have everything is checked out um thoroughly before you know processing and yeah like you know you find a property have an agent to check it out for you Make sure it's, you know, because, yeah, it's that I've, I've had a lot. I've heard a few incidents with with the, the fake listing. Yes. Right. Yeah. No, that's serious, serious, serious. And you your money will be gone if you happen to be caught up in one of these. There's no way to get your money back. So, so please listen to my sister's advice to make sure that you're getting a reputable um, real estate person and make sure you verify and check them out too. People might be yeah. passing cards out to you. Make sure that you verify that they're actually legit. 
um, mm -hmm. before working with them and that, you know, they, they have integrity and that you can trust them with doing business and so forth. So, but thank you so much for sharing your story and, you know, your ad advice about real estate and doing real estate in the United States. Nadine, I think our audience will find it very helpful. And uh, thanks for stopping by and we wish you much success on your real estate, developing thank your you. real estate business. Yeah, I look forward, you know, to helping a lot more people. So, okay, again, so we'll get your, your, you mentioned that you're on TikTok, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, mm -hmm. and you also have your, your real estate website that you will send over to us for us to put in the show notes. Yes, That's right. I will provide to, provide to you. Yes. Okay. So we'll, uh, if you need to reach out to Nadine, if you're in the Georgia area, she's licensed in Georgia and be happy to show you any properties. She's quite legitimate. She's passed the test. And it has been in operation now for over two years. And we'll be happy to take you around if you're needing to buy a property and to explain how this works here in the United States. I know you mentioned, yeah, I am licensed for Georgia only right now. But if you are living in another state, I can help you to find an agent in that state. Oh, okay. That's another part of it. That yeah, you can I, also can also, refer I can also make you another referral for wherever you are living or if you are planning to move to Georgia. Yeah. Right. Okay, very good. Transition so, from another state. Right. So you hear that, folks, if you're in another state listening to this interview and um, you want to reach out to Nadine because you feel like you can trust her and... You know, uh, if you're not in Georgia, she can uh, she can help you. She can connect you with a, a legitimate real estate person that she has a connection with and she knows it legit, is legit in another state that can work with you and help you to find properties. Whether is it, uh, should, I, should I say commercial or uh, personal? Do you work across the yeah, board? Yeah, um, residential right now, yeah. I will do some commercial as well, but my focus right now is mostly residential. Okay, very good. Yeah. And investors, you know, if any, if there's any investors out there looking for properties, I can also help with that. Okay, very good. So the full gamut. All mm -hmm. right. Well, thank you for educating us on the real estate space and sharing your story here on the immigrant experience. We wish you more success as you continue to build your real estate business and yeah, yeah. continue realizing your American dream. Thank you. We thank our listeners around the world and we appreciate your continued support as we build our human library. Please remember to give us a five-star review, subscribe and share with your friends, family and circle of influence.